We're looking back at Operation Rahat, the evacuation of nearly 5,000 Indians and nearly 2,000 foreign nationals in 2015. Ambassador Vada, thanks for giving us time again on this show. This particular evacuation was quite different from the others, especially Iraq. Iraq would have been primarily a civilian uh, aircraft. Here you had the Navy involved, you had merchant vessels, you had Air India involved, you had C-17 Globemasters as well. This was really a complicated operation. Uh, it's not just the mode of uh, evacuation, but also Coordinate. the fact that uh, there, was, uh, uh, there was bombardment going on in, in the country, in Yemen. And therefore, uh, you know, we had a window of opportunity which lasted only a few hours, in fact, three hours every day, um, which had to be negotiated and also determined early morning, mm -hmm. uh, our time. And that was the challenge because, um, you know, all the aircraft had to be in readiness. Um, there was uh, a corridor which was provided. Uh, no other airspace could be used. Uh, and the operations had to be completed, the sorties as we call them, had to be completed within that, that window. Uh, plus, there was a challenge of making sure that people uh, at the airport in, in Yemen, uh, in Sana'a, they, they boarded on time, yeah. and that all those procedures went smoothly. And then again in Djibouti, when uh, you know, there was, uh, the passengers from the planes arrived, uh, at that point in time, they had to be put into the Air Force planes uh, and then or naval vessels who would uh, ferry them back home. So I think uh, it was very, very complicated. Um, every day in the morning, uh, I personally had to coordinate a meeting of all the agencies that you just mentioned. Uh, so that included the Navy and the Air Force primarily, but also the Ministry of Home Affairs, Ministry of uh, Defense, and all the other relevant officials, uh, sometimes even the railways, who had to play their role in this as well, some officials from the states. Um, and all this was monitored very closely by then Minister for External Affairs, uh, Sushma Saraj, uh, who was overseeing all these operations. But uh, sometimes we actually had to meet a second time during the day because plans would change for the next day and everyone had to get the right instructions. When you're talking about negotiating this air corridor even while there was bombardment, so on one hand, you're dealing with the Saudis to get that air corridor because they control the airspace, so to speak. And second, you had to uh, talk to their opponents on the ground, the Houthis, who uh, were in control of uh, the Sana'a airport, uh, possibly, which probably didn't have an ATC, whose tarmac was completely damaged. So you uh, had to negotiate with both teams in that very narrow time frame. Absolutely. So, um, first of all, this window of three hours was all that we had. Um, we wanted to fly four sorties every day. Uh, and that was the maximum which was possible during that time. Uh, sometimes uh, it would amount to just three. In fact, uh, one of those days uh, we also had the Minister of State for External Affairs, uh, General V.K. Singh, who took the third sortie uh, and we could not fly the fourth one, so he had to spend the night in Sana. Uh, so it was, um, you know, a difficult situation because, uh, as you said, uh, not only the uh, Saudi authorities had to give permission. In fact, if the aircraft used to wear off, uh, from the corridor which was provided to us from Djibouti to Hodeida and then Hodeida on to Sana, uh, which was at a right angle, uh, there would be a warning issued. And uh, that meant that next day we had to be careful, otherwise they would stop uh, giving us that airspace, uh, you know, during that period of time. Uh, and yes, of course, on the ground at the airport, uh, because it was under control of, uh, uh, you know, people who were fighting the war <laughs> with Saudi Arabia, uh, so they had to be uh, also taken into confidence. Their demands had to be met as well uh, because they also had people to be evacuated, uh, which is a less talked about aspect of this operation. That itself, there were some worries that the people who were being evacuated from uh, Sana'a could have included some of the fighters as well to, to Djibouti. Mm -hmm. Was that a concern? How, how do you Absolutely, choose because, who to uh, take out? Because the, obviously the Saudi authorities would not like uh, you know, um, the aircraft to, our aircraft to take out uh, fighters, yeah. uh, which we carefully avoided. Uh, because had it been known that we were doing that, then of course all our sorties would have stopped. Uh, so we had to explain to, uh, you know, the authorities there that uh, this is something that is not possible. 
uh, it could have been possible if there was uh, if the fighters uh, could have gone to the uh, ports from where the ships were operating uh, but then it was difficult to move them from there talking about the indian navy itself now ina sumitra was already in the region but uh, tarkash and mumbai were sent out from uh, mumbai itself there were two other merchant vessels kavarti and coral which were also sent towards jibuti to bring back uh, people hmm. the difficulties that the navy faced in terms of there were a few instances when they could go alongside whether it was aden or hudaida but uh, because of the fighting soon they had to remain offshore and then smaller vessels would bring uh, the uh, people on board to be evacuated yes that was a challenge in aden uh, because aden was uh, not controlled by anybody in particular because it was uh, a free for all um, at that port there was also shelling which was happening uh, so it was difficult for uh, people to be evacuated in those circumstances uh, and therefore we had to find a private jetty uh, which um, obviously um, was um, off the port uh, the main port uh, but uh, this meant that uh, we had to have uh, transportation through dinghies uh, of uh, the indian nationals and others who had to be evacuated Uh, so this uh, operation was quite um, um, quite difficult because uh, uh, some of them were not able bodied uh, men and women uh, they were also pregnant women over there uh, and so they had to be carried on to the dinghy and then from the dinghy they had to be uh, transported on to the main craft uh, so that was a difficult operation and some of them were very very afraid of going into the sea in those circumstances Uh, but ultimately the navy handled it very well they was they were professionals absolutely and they used to counsel people who were not being afraid of the sea that they were there to help them out uh, and on once on board they were very well taken care of the, the human angle is one thing i'll get on both those ships because we reported extensively on that even though we couldn't get to that area but because of the situation and when the ships couldn't go alongside say in aden or al hudaida after Uh, fighting broke out there they were taking standard operating procedures to protect the vessel itself because there could be any boat that uh, approaches with uh, a malefied intent absolutely they had to they had to take those uh, standard operating procedures into account in fact there were a couple of instances uh, once in aden and once in hudaida when uh, there were you know other boats which approached the uh, vessel and they had to warn them off Uh, and that's actually worked quite well uh, at the same time i think uh, you know because of the fact that uh, there was uh, a pressure of of people wanting to get evacuated meant that there was no um, queue formation uh, on the shore and uh, that was a bigger challenge crowd control was something crowd control was difficult <laughs> uh, but fortunately we had community leaders on the ground with whom we were in touch regularly uh the mission in sana was also in touch with them regularly so that that helped a lot because they were able to control the crowds and they themselves were stayed back and they left uh, right at the end you're talking about the counseling that both uh, the indian navy and the air force also had to do for people who were extremely nervous about the whole situation i do remember we were reporting on how for example a complement of crew on board the ins uh, mumbai Uh, or sumitra for that instance had taken on board more civilians than they were actually crew members and th- though now they have hadr bricks on board etc these ships are not really uh, designed for this kind of role but the bunks were emptied the crew was working 24 hours a day the women and children were given the bunks and the men were kept on on board it was quite yes, spectacular I, human i mean in the effort. sense that the personnel on on the ship themselves gave away their own personal um you know bunks and uh, that's how uh, the children and the women could be put uh, in that section of the ship and because it was difficult to keep small children on the open deck uh, difficult to control them first of all and secondly also they were exposed to the elements uh, so that was a big sacrifice i would think uh, from the navy uh, every day um in the morning in the afternoon and in the evenings uh, they used to tell me what exactly was happening to each ship and how many people had boarded whether there were any incidents or not 
and uh, so that helped us um, deal with situations as 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 they developed because we had the experience of hindsight uh, the next day was better than the previous one uh, but i would say that right from the beginning itself uh, the operations were conducted very very smoothly uh, sometimes there were flaring of tempers uh, which happened only in Djibouti, not when uh, they were being evacuated from Sana. Uh, but at that point in time, I think it was quickly taken care of because we had a very good uh, team on the ground in Djibouti as well, uh, where uh, General B.K. Singh himself was uh, present. Um, and I must say, uh, our Minister of External Affairs, Sushma Saraj, at that time uh, was monitoring this uh, every day, and she used to, I had to go and report to her uh, at least three or four times a day as to how the operation was going uh, and anything which was happening on the ground she was very very interested in and she would take personal instructions, give personal instructions uh, and expect those to be carried out which we had to, we had to then relay to the team uh, with whom we were coordinating in Delhi uh, and then the team would uh, send out instructions to everybody who was on the ground. So in fact, what you're describing is apart from the Indian Navy, the Air Force, the Civil Carrier Air India, uh, you had those two merchant vessels, the various stakeholders in Delhi, who you're talking to the Home Ministry, probably the Civil Aviation Ministry, Railways, because that came into the picture right at the end. Yes. So there was a triangular kind of effort, Delhi, uh, Djibouti and Sana on the ground with teams. Absolutely. There. In fact, the ambassador in Sana uh, was talking to me uh, continuously, every two hours in fact. Uh, we had the Sharjah affairs at that time in, in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, who was uh, also in touch with me regularly because we had to make sure that our uh, instructions for the next day from the Saudi authorities were also on time. Uh, if they had not been in time, then we could not plan our sorties out because the hours used to change uh, every day. And normally it used to be in the afternoon, but could be early afternoon, could be later afternoon. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that had to be uh, that had to be coordinated with everybody who was on the ground. So, it's a, it was not a simple operation at all. And uh, the railways is not talked about very often in this, yeah. because, but it was the final stretch to yes. get all these people home. That's why they were required, right? Right, because uh, not everybody could be flown uh, to their hometown. So, obviously, uh, the railways became very important, especially uh, in Maharashtra. Uh, and I must say here again, our minister personally spoke to the railway minister uh, and ensured that proper instructions were issued so that they were there at the stations and they were helping the people out, put them onto trains, etc. The lessons that you, you, you're saying, say, were well, learned the previous day would, would take you forward the next day in terms of uh, mistakes m made or successes that you had reached overall. Uh, when we talk about India's prep preparedness, with so many agencies involved, are we uh, functional in terms of institutionalizing this process of evacuating non-combatant uh, EAs? Is, is that what it's called? Non-combatant evacuation, evacuation operations. operations yeah. Is it institutionalized to the extent? I know there's an intergovernmental group, but in, like the developed countries have, but why even developed Brazil, China have uh, this in their doctrines? Are we prepared enough? We are very well prepared and I'm very proud to say that because I saw that work firsthand. Uh, and um, I was of course given… It's not reactive. It's not reactive at all. I think uh, once we take a decision, uh, the machinery of Indian government and institutions works very well. Uh, we actually took a decision on 26th, for example, to make sure that you know everybody is out of Yemen. Uh, and it uh, uh, took us about two weeks, but we cleared everybody out. And you can see from the figures that it's close to 7,000 people. We not only helped Indians, yeah. uh, close to 5,000 Indians, but also helped uh, foreigners, around 2,000 foreigners. 48 countries. 48 countries. Yeah. Uh, in fact, they were, um, uh, you know, most of the ambassadors here was, whose, whose nationals were stuck in Yemen um, used to come and, and see me or call me at any, any odd time. Uh, and we were always open to that and our minister had issued uh, special instructions uh, to make sure that everybody who comes with a request, if they could be accommodated, that India should be open to that and that earned us a lot of goodwill uh, and our um, Navy and the Air Force were totally up to it. You know, they had their own functional uh, constraints at some points in time, uh, but they quickly solved them. 
and uh, if they could not solve it on the ground then it would be escalated and we would then get in touch with the chiefs and uh, they would step in and they would help out uh, so in in my experience i have never seen uh, you know such a smooth operation which was so complicated uh, so that gives me a lot of confidence to say to tell you today that you know we can repeat this any time the, there were others involved i think the chinese took out there or took out uh, civilians about a week before we did uh, from the ports a pakistani vessel actually saved about 10 11 indians and they were taken to karachi then flown uh, by a special pakistani air force plane back here of course times have changed since then but uh, in in terms of comparison to other countries in dealing with this do you think we we go we get up with flying colors ours was a much much smoother and better operation i would say uh, it was not sporadic the others were sporadic uh, in fact the Just chinese sustained and yes yeah, sustained multi pronged absolutely the chinese uh, boat had to wait for a long time about 3 days off the coast of eden uh, because before they undertook their evacuation um, none of them actually attempted such a large operation from hodeida uh, which was uh, again not under anybody's control uh, fortunately there was not so much of firing over there uh, eden was under fire uh, but the number of people that were involved as far as india is concerned were the most and that's why most countries turned to us because we had a sustained operation uh, of the air force and uh, and indian airlines over a long period of time uh, we of course could not send in our military aircraft yeah. into sana yeah. that's how air india came in uh and therefore um, they had to be prepared to make sure that the time turnaround time was minimalistic uh and the operation on the ground went very smoothly so they had to post people of also there to coordinate so i think uh, all in all it was a excellent operation when you talk about air india they are again not often get enough credit for what they're doing when the armed forces are involved but apart from the operational skill that they had to Uh, be involved with in landing in sana you know, high altitude mountains hardly any probably no atc damaged tarmac securing the plane getting the people on board is also the financial cost that uh, that air india and indian airlines pay over such kind of operations which is not really particularly put out there so much um, i completely agree and with that and if they're going to get privatized then what happens you you're going to lose one arm um, very necessary arm in these kind of operations absolutely i think uh, they did an excellent job uh, and as you say the the cash flow doesn't happen immediately um, in this case of course uh, our minister was very responsive and she ensured that they were compensated for whatever expenses they had uh, undertaken in a timely manner but most of the operations which uh, which are involved in oper- evacuation of people or nationals um you know there is a time lag between uh, the time that they actually undertake the operations and before they get compensated financially for it uh, so um, in that sense um, yeah they are the unsung heroes there were lots of them and we and actually interviewed uh, even some of the naval personnel in, on board uh, tarkash and mumbai when they returned ambassador bado again thank you for sharing your experiences and letting us see through your eyes what was happening at that time thank you again thank you